Okay, I have another great story for you today. I don't know about you, but I kind of like this Sager story, right? And all my lectures are a story in one way or another, but some more dramatic than others. This is a pretty good story. In fact, some historians have called the story of Frederick Douglass the great American story because it's the story of a man's struggle to be free, which is the story of America, right? And to be equal. Frederick Douglass. Frederick Bailey was born a Maryland slave in 1818. He never knew his father, but he suspected that his master was his father. And this was not unusual on the great plantations of the South in the antebellum years. Antebellum, before the war. Ante before bellum, Latin for war. What's the war in question? Civil War marks a, a change, obviously, from the culture of the South. Slavery dominated before the war and the end of slavery shortly after the war. He was separated from his mother at an early age and was raised on the plantation as a virtual orphan. In 1826, when he was only about eight years old, his master died. And the plantation, along, the, along with the slaves that were considered to be just property, was divided amongst his heirs. Eight-year-old Frederick was sent to the city of Baltimore, a southern city, where he became a servant companion for the son of Hugh and Sophia Auld. <clears throat> so he leaves the plantation and he goes to live in the city, but he's still a slave. And there's a vast difference between city slaves and plantation slaves, unless one was lucky enough on a plantation to become a domestic slave, that is, to work in the household. Otherwise, you were consigned to the fields. And that was where life was extraordinarily difficult. Sophia was a kindly woman and a devout Methodist Christian. Again, this is the era of the Second Great Awakening. And she decided to teach both her own son and Frederick how to read from the Bible. Sophia's husband, Hugh, objected to this strenuously, saying, if you teach that boy to read, there will be no keeping him. It will forever unfit him to be a slave. There's some irony here. Hugh Auld was typical of white Southerners. In an unusual moment of clear thinking about the intellectual qualities of the African American race, Auld was convinced that if blacks learned to read, it would make them unfit to be slaves. They would not make good slaves. Of course, if blacks really were an inferior race, which is how Southerners rationalized slavery, either they could not learn to read, or if they did learn to read, it would do them no good. Knowing this was not true. Southern states passed laws against teaching blacks to read. It was illegal to do this. Now, hypocrisy is part of the human condition. But this is an extreme example. And when I say that hypocrisy is part of the human condition, not, there is no single human being who is free from some aspect of hypocrisy. Think about it. Are any of you perfect? I know that I am not. I know that I am very quick to forgive something in my own life that I will not forgive in yours, at least not very quickly. That makes me a hypocrite. And anybody who spent 10 seconds examining their own life would realize that they were, at least in some way, 
a hypocrite as well. Now, that doesn't mean that some of us aren't bigger hypocrites than others, okay? It's just a question of degree. This is another example where my Christianity leads me to truth about the human condition. And if I haven't said it before, one of the reasons I'm a Christian is that because my study of history and my study of the Christian faith tells me the truth about the human condition. Well, little Frederick actually heard what Hugh Auld said. He remembered Auld's cutting words. They sank deep into my heart, he later wrote. He resolved right then to unfit himself to be a slave. Eight years old. Now he earned small change at odd jobs and paid neighbor boys to teach him how to read. He read newspapers that had been thrown away in the streets. And in this way, he learned of the abolition. Now, if he was still confined to a plantation, this would not have been possible. But life for a city slave, a young boy, is different. He has these opportunities, these moments, that if he chooses to take advantage of them, they will change him. And so he learns of the abolition movement because he has taught himself to read with the help of a few others. And then he reads these newspapers that had been discarded. When he was 14, Douglas had a classic conversion experience at Bethel Chapel of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the church that Richard Allen had founded. Classic conversion experience. There is a moment then when he realizes that Jesus Christ is his Savior. Again, think of the lecture on the Second Great Awakening. Now a Christian, his faith did not soften his hatred of slavery or diminish his desire to escape. And indeed, he did try to escape as a young man, unsuccessfully. Hugh Auld was determined now to destroy young Frederick's rebellious nature. He sent the young man out of the city back to a plantation with instructions for the overseer there to break him. Now, much later in life, Frederick wrote of his experiences on the plantation. This is his memoir, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Narrative is just a fancy way of saying story, story of the life of Frederick Douglass. Narrative history is history told by story, so I tend to give you narrative history in this class. The other way of doing it is to give you a PowerPoint with seven points or whatever, and, you know, point by point by point. Not a story, but an analysis. I don't know about you, but I like stories better than analysis, right? As long as you get the point from the story. So, Frederick Douglass. I lived with Mr. Covey one year. This is about now he's being exiled to the plantation, okay? I lived with Mr. Covey for one year. During the first six months of that year, scarce a week passed without his whipping me. I was seldom free from a sore back. My awkwardness was almost always his excuse for whipping me. We were worked fully up to the point of endurance. Long before day broke, we were up, our horses fed, and by the first approach of day, we were off to the field with our hoes and plowing teams. Mr. Covey gave us enough to eat, but scarce time to eat it. We were often less than five minutes taking our meals. We were often in the field from the first approach of day till its last lingering ray had left us, and at saving fodder time, 
Midnight often caught us in the field binding blades, especially if there were full moon. Covey would be out with us. The way he used to stand it was this. He would spend most of his afternoons in bed. He would then come out fresh in the evening, ready to urge us on with his words, example, and frequently with his whip. Mr. Covey was one of the few slaveholders who could and did work with his hands. He was a hardworking man. He knew by himself just what a man or a boy could do. There was no deceiving him. His work went on in his absence almost as well as in his presence. And he had the faculty of making us feel that he was ever present with us. This he did by surprising us. He seldom approached the spot where we were at work openly if he could do it secretly. He always aimed at taking us by surprise. Such was his cunning that we used to call him among ourselves the snake. When we were at work in a cornfield, he would sometimes crawl on his hands and knees to avoid detection, and all at once he would rise nearly in our midst and scream out, Ha ha, come, come! Dash on, dash on. This being his mode of attack, it was never safe to stop working a single minute. He would whip them. His comings were like a thief in the night. He appeared to us as being ever at hand. He was under every tree, behind every stump, in every bush, and at every window on the plantation. Mr. Covey's forte, his strength, consisted in his power to deceive. His life was devoted to planning and perpetrated the grossest deceptions. Everything he possessed in the shape of learning or religion, he made conform to his disposition to deceive. He seemed to think himself equal to deceiving the Almighty. He would make a short prayer in the morning and a long prayer at night, and strange as it may seem, few men would at times appear more devotional than he. The exercises of his family devotions were always commenced with singing, and he was a very poor singer himself. The duty of raising the hymn generally then came upon me. Poor man. Such was his disposition and success at deceiving. I do verily believe that he sometimes deceived, deceived himself into the solemn belief that he was a sincere worshiper of the Most High God. And this, too, at a time when he may be said to have been guilty of compelling his woman slave to commit the sin of adultery. The facts in the case are these. Mr. Covey was a poor man. He was just commencing in life. He was only able to buy one slave, and shocking as is the fact, he bought her, as he said, for a breeder. This woman was named Caroline. Mr. Covey bought her from Mr. Thomas Lowe about six miles from St. Michael's. She was a large, able-bodied woman about 20 years old. She had already given birth to one child, which proved her to be just what Mr. Covey wanted. After buying her, he hired a man, a married man, slave, <clears throat> a married man of Mr. Samuel Harrison, to live with him one year, and him he used to fasten up with her every night. The result was that, at the end of the year, the miserable woman gave birth to twins. At this result, Mr. Covey seemed to be highly pleased, both with the man and the wretched woman. Such was his joy, and that of his own wife, that nothing they could do for Carolyn during her pregnancy was too good or too hard to be done. The children were regarded as being quite an addition to his wealth. 
If at any one time of my life more than another, I was made to drink the bitterest dregs of slavery, that time was during the first six months of my stay with Mr. Covey. We were worked in all weathers. It was never too hot or too cold. It could never rain, blow, hail, or snow too hard for us to work in the field. Work, work, work was scarcely more the order of the day than of the night. The longest days were too short for him, and the shortest nights too long for him. I was somewhat unmanageable. I mean, that's why he was sent there, right? I was somewhat unmanageable when I first went there. But a few months of this discipline tamed me. Mr. Covey succeeded in breaking me. I was broken in body, soul, and spirit. My natural elasticity was crushed. My intellect languished. The disposition to read departed. The cheerful spark that lingered about my eye died. The dark night of slavery closed in upon me. And behold, a man transformed into a brute. But it wasn't true. That's what he thought at the time. After a year of living on the plantation, believing he had broken Frederick, and Frederick believed it, as we've just seen, the overseer sent the young man back to Hugh Ald in the city of Baltimore. Mission accomplished, he bragged. Ald now eventually allowed Frederick to work learning the trade of a ship cocker on Baltimore's dock. So again, the vast majority of slaves work on the, in the fields and on the plantations and such. But some were city slaves and some were house slaves. And this is a different kind of life. So now if you're a city slave and you learn a trade, you can actually earn wages. And some masters would allow such slaves to keep a small portion of the wages that they earned as an incentive. See? But most of the money would go to the master. And so then a slave in the city with a skill like Shipcock, it was a valuable commodity. And so that's why Hugh Auld wanted Frederick to learn a trade. But that requires a certain freedom. You've got to go to the docks. You've got to work there. You meet people and so forth. Escape. Working the dockyards of Baltimore, Frederick got to know many people and was not constantly watched. He even managed to save a little, bit mo a little money. Gradually now, his spirit returned. Eventually, he resolved to escape his chains. Inspiring him in this decision was his love for a free black woman by the name of Anna Murray. Two things, however, caused him great distress as he thought about escape and his life. The first was the thought of leaving his friends. He had friends. And to escape meant that he would never see them again. The second, and the greater fear, I'm sure, was the fear of being caught in a second escape attempt. He knew that if he were caught, the punishment now would be most severe. He was no longer a boy. He'd already been punished once for attempting to escape. And the likelihood now that if he tried to escape and was caught again, his master would say, the boy, the man, is irreconcilable. I will sell him into the deep south, to a plantation, 
where they're raising cotton or sugarcane in Louisiana or Alabama. And the chances of escaping from that life were slim and none. And the chances of living to be even 50 years old on such a deep south plantation were also slim and none. The work and the climate being what they were. What would you do? Now, Frederick Douglass was fortunate. He was lucky, or was he blessed? Because he met a free black sailor, someone who worked on one of those ships that came to port. And this free black sailor, at great personal risk, gave Frederick Douglass his papers. His papers that said, I'm a free man. And so Frederick decides to take advantage of this great opportunity. He escapes by railroad. He gets on the train. He's got his papers. He's got some money. And it was easy. The escape was not hard. He later wrote, going to live in Baltimore laid the foundation and opened the gateway to all my subsequent prosperity. I have ever regarded it as the first plain manifestation of that kind providence which has ever since attended me. Providence, of course, another word for God. He's saying that God guided him, God helped him. Free at last, Frederick changed his last name to Douglas. And then he added a second S on the end for distinction. So whenever you see that Douglas with two S's, you know it's Frederick, not Stephen. Right? And Douglas now sent for who? Remember the free black woman that he loved in Baltimore? Well, she's free. She had always been free. And so now she can come north and join him, and when she did, they were married. Douglas began attending abolitionist meetings. Abolitionism, the idea that slavery should be, should be abolished in the United States as soon as possible. Come what may. Abolitionism. He began attending such meetings at black churches in Massachusetts. In 1841, he gave an anti-slavery speech that brought him to the attention of the great voice of abolition at the time, William Lloyd Garrison. And Garrison is a name you should know. He is the great voice of abolitionism at that time. From the 1830s right up to the eve of the Civil War. There will be others. And Frederick Douglass himself will become one of the great abolitionist speakers. But Garrison is the heart and soul, if you will, of this movement. Garrison knew that the testimony of escaped slaves in front of whites who didn't really know that much about slavery. Remember, this is a three-mile-an-hour world, and there is, there's no television. And if there is a, a picture of anything in a newspaper or a, or a periodical at this time, it is, a, it is just a, a cartoon, right? It is a pencil rendering of something. But to have a free black man who was a slave stand in front of you and tell you about slavery, that's compelling. Even more compelling if that free black man is an educated man, someone who can read and write and speak with power and authority. And Frederick Douglass could. Because in addition to learning to read and to write when he was a young man, he also studied oratory, that is the ability or that is the skill of, of public speaking. And oratory is largely a, a lost art today. 
Perhaps the greatest orator that you have heard is your pastor as he delivers the Sunday sermon. But in this day and age, and for a long time afterwards, a lot of politicians were great orators as well. Now, not so much. But Frederick Douglass became a great speaker, a public speaker. And it didn't hurt that he had this magnificent voice, deep voice. Great singing voice as well, as we've already noticed. Frederick Douglass. And so now William Lloyd Garrison puts Frederick Douglass to work as an abolitionist speaker. And the American Anti-Slavery Society hired Douglass to tour the North and give anti-slavery speeches. As a boy, Frederick Douglass, and I just mentioned this briefly already, but he had obtained a copy of the Columbian Orator, which is a magazine book, actually, that urged abolitionism, but also the ability to speak in public. So he had consumed that book as a boy, uh, whereas, you know, when I was a boy, I consumed Sports Illustrated. <laughs> and he even took it with him when he escaped, a Colombian orator. So he was a master of the art of public speaking. And now the revolution in transportation and communication that was taking place in the United States and, in fact, in the world is going to have a tremendous impact on the abolitionist movement because we are moving from a three mile an hour world into a world in which it's possible to move by train or by steamship. And that ideas are eventually gonna move quickly over telegraph wires. So that three mile an hour world is changing. And so ideas and newsletters and magazines and such pamphlets are gonna move more quickly and more thoroughly from one place to another. Because the transportation revolution made travel and communication so much easier, Douglas recognized that those opposed to the expansion of liberty and freedom were gonna have a very difficult time keeping those ideas, freedom, liberty for all men, confined to one region of the country. Douglas wrote, a revolution now cannot be confined to the place or the people where it may commence, but flashes with lightning speed from heart to heart, from land to land, until it has traversed the globe. And we have seen recently, with the advent of the cell phone in the hands of virtually anyone, uh, the ability then of information and an organizational information to be, be spread amongst thousands and then tens of thousands and even millions of people to organize civil unrest, demonstrations, and even rebellions. Recently, this has been taking place in Hong Kong. Yeah. Ironically, this improvement in transportation and communication brought North and South closer together. While it also contributes then to mutual distrust and anger. In 1831, the state of Georgia, a southern state, offered a $5,000 reward for the arrest of William Lloyd Garrison, the Massachusetts abolitionist. Yes. All Garrison did was exercise his free speech right in Massachusetts. The state of Georgia didn't appreciate what he had to say, abolitionism. $5,000 reward they're offering to bring him south to Georgia. Kidnapping, okay? Just a few years before this, no one would have known or cared in the south about the so-called ravings of a Massachusetts abolitionist. But transportation and communication becoming quicker, more effective. Brings us closer together and yet separates us, you see. So too with Douglas in the 1840s. 
He became both famous as an abolitionist speaker, but also in danger. What if his old master recognized him? There were people who worked as bounty hunters who went north to find escaped slaves. That was their job. In 1845, he published his memoir, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, which I've already read from. This book was very popular. And so Douglass then becomes even more well-known in the late 1840s. Now he decided to leave the United States and go to England on a speaking tour. So English abolitionists, those who had already been successful in England, slavery was abolished in the British Empire in 1833. This is the story of William Wilberforce and so forth. Perhaps you've heard of this. But these English abolitionists were still interested in abolitionism in the world, certainly in the old colony. And so they invited Frederick Douglass to come to England and speak. Well, this would certainly help Frederick Douglass uh, in his desire to stay free because he's going to be out of the United States. As historian Daniel Walker Howe has explained, and I quoted Daniel Walker Howe in the Second Great Awakening lecture, 19th century reformers, that includes abolitionists, in the English-speaking world almost always shared a common Christian faith. Almost always. They were motivated not only by a Christian sense of compassion for other human beings, but also by the expectation that by making the world a better place, they were preparing the world for the return of Jesus Christ. So back to theology for just a moment. Theology is crucial. If you're going to understand the world, if you're going to understand the Christian faith, you have to understand some theology. Just as an aside, one of the prayers that I pray for my family almost every morning, I'd love to tell you every morning because I set out to do it every morning, but some days because I'm imperfect, I just don't get it done. But I usually start my family prayer with, Lord, help us to recognize your grace, to receive your Holy Spirit, to believe in your son and help us to understand the Christian faith. So in an attempt to understand the Christian faith, so here are these Christian reformers working to make the world a better place. This is what the Bible tells them to do, to spread the gospel, convert people, Make the world a better place. The idea that the world would gradually get better and then Christ would return when the world had achieved a certain degree of Christianity, and I don't know what that degree was, okay? But it would get better and better and more Christian and more Christian, and then eventually Christ would come back and establish the millennial kingdom. That is millennialism. Millennial. And the vast majority of American Christians in the 19th century were millennialists. Okay? Now, some of you are saying to yourself, and good for you, that does not sound like my Christianity in my church. Because now, in the 20th century and in the early 21st century, I would, I would guess uh, the vast majority of evangelical Christians are not millennialists. The world is not going to get better and better and better, and then Christ returns. The world is going to what? Yeah, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And then Christ returns in judgment to establish the millennial kingdom. That's called premillennialism. Pre Can't stand here and tell you which is right. Looks like the world's going the wrong way right now, if you ask me. Certainly Christianity in the traditionally Christian states of Europe and the United States seems to be on the decline, right? Yeah. To the point where here we are in the, 
in uh, 2019 where Christianity is actually seen as the enemy by, by a large number of Americans. They'd like to see it go away. We've never before been here in this situation. That's what I'm talking about, decline. But history teaches me that events can be like waves, you know, at the beach. Wave comes in, wave goes out again. So you can't say for sure if 50 years from now what the situation will be. Wave comes in, wave goes out. Pendulum, you could use the pendulum metaphor if you'd like, okay? Don't know. But it's helpful to know what millennialism is and what premillennialism is. Search the Bible for yourself or the scriptures and make up your own mind. When I was a very young man, I was absolutely convinced that the Lord was coming back in 10 or 20 years. That was 10 or 20 years ago. <laughs> okay? Premillennial position. See. I decided somewhere along the way that I'd let him decide. Okay? And that I would follow the scriptures that tell me to just follow the call. Do what I'm called to do. So, enough theology for the moment. We turn to the United States from his trip to Britain. Eventually, some friends helped Fred Frederick Douglass raise enough money to send the money to his former master and buy his freedom. Doesn't have to worry about the bounty hunters now. He returns to the United States in 1847, and he moved to the burned over district of upstate New York, western New York. Why is that called the burned over district? Yeah, that's where the heart of the Second Great Awakening was. That's where the fire of the Holy Spirit first caught forth in the, in the minds and hearts of the American people, the burned over district. In his spare time now, he campaigns for abolitionism, but his job was to be the editor of a newspaper called the North Star. The North Star. And the North Star, of course, advocates abolitionism in the United States. And now Douglas grew impatient with his Christian brothers and sisters. And he began to advocate that Christian churches in the North disassociate themselves from their brothers and sisters in the South. And in fact, as I told you in the Second Great Awakening lecture, they were already doing this, the Presbyterians in 1837 and the Methodists and Baptists in the 1840s, but others seemed to be dragging their feet. Okay. And again, Douglas was disenchanted with this. And then in regard to the war with Mexico in 1846, and I'll lecture on the war with Mexico on Tuesday, then we'll complete this portion of the course and have the test on Thursday. So we have a significant war with Mexico coming. In regard to that war, Douglas took his stand with John Quincy Adams, the former president, and with a young congressman from Illinois, tall fellow, perhaps you've heard of him, Abraham Lincoln. And upon the occasion of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which was the result of the Mexican War. Douglas said, and again, he's agreeing with Adams and Lincoln, the United States have succeeded in robbing Mexico of her territory. And the United States are rejoicing over their success under the hypocritical pretense of bringing peace to the South. Frederick Douglass, opposed to the war with Mexico. So was Adams, so was Lincoln. And I'll tell you a few other famous Americans in the lecture on Tuesday who were opposed to this war. Douglass's vision 
Douglas's unhappiness, his disaffection for many in the Christian churches eventually lead him to a change in his spiritual views. They led him to a more transcendental view of spirituality. I'll explain. But you've read about the transcendentalists, and so, so Douglas is, is, becomes a transcendentalist. He focused on the spiritual and moral potential of human beings rather than on the historic Christian faith. Douglas saw himself as a man who transcended, or rose above, if you prefer, racial differences. He believed that all men could follow him regardless of race on a path upward to the fulfillment of human potential. He hoped America would be the place where humanity, all races, could rise to the lofty level that transcendentalists believed was possible. If it helps think back to the Enlightenment, transcendentalism is just another movement in Enlightenment thought about the potential, the goodness of mankind. And so Douglas now, in his transcendentalist phase late in life, abandons the Christian view of man as sinful. For the Enlightenment transcendentalist view of man as humanly perfectible. For Douglas now, it just simply becomes a matter of time before human progress takes mankind to this new level of perfection. Douglas believed Ralph Waldo Emerson, another of the famous transcendentalists, when he wrote, in this continent, the asylum of all nations, the energy of Irish, German, Swedes, Poles, Cossacks, and all the European tribes of the Africans and the Polynesians will construct a new race, a new religion, a new state, a new literature. In other words, Douglas put his faith now in the great American melting pot. He refused to take part in movements that would separate blacks from whites. And then if abolition were successful, send the freed blacks back to Africa. There were all kinds of ideas like this. Uh, the idea that, well, we, we need to free the slaves. Let's end slavery. And then, well, what do we do with the blacks? Some people were saying, well, we'll send them all back to Africa. Right. Douglas is saying none of that. None of that. It wasn't even physically possible. You couldn't do the math and the shipping and so forth and have it happen. Okay. It wasn't possible. So for Douglas, America, America had to be the freedman's home. But for Douglas, it had to be the home of any, of every person, right? Of every kind of person, I should say. Like Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass was a self-made man. When the two men met in the White House during the Civil War, Douglas sensed that the president treated him with respect and regarded him as a kindred spirit. A man who had dedicated himself as Lincoln had to self-education. This is one of the great lessons history can teach. Lincoln and Douglas and countless others dedicated to self-education. Having often doubted Lincoln in the past, why would Frederick Douglass doubt Abraham Lincoln? Why would he question him? Isn't Lincoln the great emancipator? Isn't Lincoln the man who led the Union, who led the United States to victory in the Civil War and ended slavery? 
Yeah. But you see, Lincoln never wanted the war. I'll explain this time and again in the next few weeks, but Lincoln's plan for ending slavery was gradual. He was pretty well convinced that if you tried to end slavery the way the abolitionists wanted to do it, it would bring on a war. So end slavery gradually so that there would be no war. That was the plan. Douglas was an abolitionist. Had to be now. Come hell or high water. See, they disagreed. Now, as it turned out, the South wasn't going to let Lincoln do it gradually. Okay? It was war anyway. Again, I'll explain. But that's why Lincoln was doubted by Douglas. They didn't agree on how to get rid of slavery regarding the timetable. But they met in the middle of the war, and Lincoln impressed Douglas, and Douglas senses this kindred spirit. And so Americans today could take great inspiration from the life of Frederick Douglass. His is the great American story. He is a symbol of the American man and his quest for equality, his quest for freedom. He was enslaved by men who believed him to be an animal. He broke his chains. He walked away from the house of slavery. He made himself an educated man. And then he used that education to help burn down the house of slavery. If that's not the great American story, I don't know what is. Questions? All right. God bless you all. See you Tuesday.